I'm going to start a new series tonight, and uh, I have prepared and looked and and uh, read and wrote and scrapped it and redid it again. I like the outline. I didn't like the outline. So whatever outline I pick, I'm still sensitive to the Lord to take us where he wants us to go. Amen. Uh, I tell people preparation and study is not to preach. It's so that you can learn as well. Preaching comes from the unction, the anointing inside of you. But you have to know something for it to come out. You know, I, I heard things when I was young and listening to some Pentecostal churches. Don't worry about it. Just open your mouth and let God fill it. Well, I've heard some stupid stuff <laughs> come out of people's mouths. Amen. Some stupid stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I preach in some churches out in the country and Tennessee and and there is Kentucky where I'd hide my notes because if they thought you had notes, it was a canned message. And they would say you wasn't anointed, anointed at all. You need some anointing. And I didn't have any anointing on me if I had notes. So uh, I just memorized them. And uh, <laughs> so they had it. But anyway, thanks be unto God. The Bible says, study, study to do what? <coughs> Show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed able to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. All right. So uh, turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter four. Yeah. I'm going to talk about walking in your destiny. Now I'm going to deal with some things that some people would think, well, you know, that's, that's maybe minister meeting stuff or whatever, but I'm going to talk about walking in destiny. God wants us to walk with an anointing on our life and he wants us to be able to help people. And I think we're going to be able to help people the more that we understand the word of God, understand ministry gifts, understand what those gifts are for. That's going to help you do this. Amen. And so Ephesians chapter four, if you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not too late, I'm going to start at verse one, which we would start later on in the chapter. Verse one. I therefore, Ephesians 4, 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling. Now, one, another word would be vocation. Now, when you see the word vocation, uh, some people get it mixed up in what's going on. I like the word vocation, but I like the word calling. All right? So, I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all loneliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as you are called into one hope of your calling. Now, I'm going to bring this down into the area of what we would call the uh, five-fold ministry gifts all the way down into the gifts that work in the local body because I think we understand it. Because there's one thing I think people get confused about is my call. What am I called? This is my call. This is my ministry. This is my ministry. This is my call. And I think sometimes we can get it so convoluted that we don't have a joy to do anything. And... Uh, so I want us to break this down and understand what it is so that people are not scratching around trying to figure out what God's doing in their life. And I think as a local church, we ought to understand that pew warming is not a part of a call of God. Amen. And uh, the impression you leave is not your bottom in the cushion. That's not the impression we want to leave on the body of Christ, amen? The only impression in the church is the impression your backside makes in that cushion, all right? We need, a, we need to leave a different impression than that, amen? And so, matter of fact, that 
If that's the only impression you leave, you'll never make an impact on anybody. So we need to be able to make an impact on people. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, I ministered this one time when I was doing a a baptism service. It says one baptism. But actually, here, when it says one God, one Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So, but we are baptized into the body. We can be baptized into the Holy Spirit. And we can be baptized in water. So even though there's three distinct baptisms, we're talking about here into this body here where we're at. Verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of the gifts of Christ. Grace is given according to the gifts of Christ. When he ascended on high, he led captivities captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. Now, chapter 1 will give you a lot of this stuff and uh, the end of chapter 1 and going into that of Ephesians so you can see that. Okay, verse 11. And he himself... I like that. And he himself, that means he didn't need help. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. So if I reinterpret this, there's two ways. The the equipping of the saints... Then it would be number two for the work of the ministry, as if the one who's a one who's has one of these gifts does that. But that's not really what it's talking about. It's talking about our job is to equip the saints so the saints can continue to do the work of the ministry. That's how you're empowered to do these things. So my job is not just to be a pastor, a preacher, a teacher. I've said this from day one, 17 years ago. I have a responsibility to be an equipper. You must be equipped. People that are not properly equipped suffer. They flounder. They wonder what use am I for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So it's equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect or mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men and the cunningness, craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ So this is some scriptures that I want us to begin to look at and begin to study this today. uh, I'm just going to read some things that I wrote down so I don't skip it. There's one thing for sure. I said no one steps directly into anything that God had purposed them to do from the, let's call it from the foundation of the world. No one steps into that ultimate mandate without going first Through spiritual training. You know, I've met people that were just barely 17, 18 years old in Africa. And they're already calling them apostles, already calling them prophets. And and I'm thinking if we understand the word of God and different things like that. Now, I'm not saying that may not be an ultimate call or, or a mandate upon their life. But that is not where you start. As one missionary put it years ago, the only job you start off on top is when you're digging a hole. Outside of that, you start from the bottom and you go up. You learn. Elisha didn't start off being Elijah. Come on. Joshua didn't start off being Moses. There's things that people do to be able to grasp. In essence, if we're not faithful with the small, we can forget 
being able to be responsible for something more important. I've had people that were associate pastors that were friends of mine that I've met, that I've ministered in different conferences, and uh, they'd come to me and say, How, well, what can I do to become full-time in ministry? I would say, explain to me what you mean full-time in ministry. Well, you know, where I can make a living and, and different things like that. Well, if you're looking for full-time in ministry just to make a living, you're already operating with the wrong mindset. It has nothing to do with the money has everything to do with the purpose of God up on your life. And I asked them, "Why don't are you helping someone? Are you an associate?" And one person exact words. Now I'm not going to be somebody's associate. I've done that before. All they do is the dirty work while the main guy gets all the pats on the back. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do anything until I get that senior position. I'm thinking you have stepped into a puddle of ignorance. And you can't find your way out. The truth is, you got to be willing to be faithful with, with, with a man's sheep, another man's sheep, before God will give you your own flock. David had to be faithful with his father's sheep before he was ever king. Come on. You, you got to know how to be promoted. Promotion doesn't come from the, from the east or the west. Promotion doesn't come from the north or the south. Promotion comes from the Lord. And if we're not faithful with what he puts in our hands, then we'll never achieve. I understand what people are saying because they get to praying and they think, well, this is what God wants me to do. And uh, I'm not going to do it until I get to do that. You know, there's been people here since I've been here. They're no longer here, most of them. Uh, will, will you help in this area? And that's not my call. Will you help here? That's not my call either. Well, maybe you'll never get into your call until you're willing to show yourself faithful. Amen. See, I came out of Rama in May of 87. And when I came out of Rama in May of 87, I knew in my heart exactly what I was going to do. See, in between... First year and second year at Rama, the big deal is, what are you going to do the second year? I was not confused. They had a missions program. I was going to go into missions. I didn't have to pray about it. I didn't fast three days and ask God to see two angels. I knew missions was my heart. I didn't say, do I go to pastors? Do, do, is my concentration going to be pastoral? Is it going to be this? Is it going to be that? They even had music. I didn't consider that neither. Um, is it going to be this or this or that? But no, they had missions. I didn't have to pray about it. When I went back into missions, uh, I had friends. Two of them had passed on to heaven. Out of all the people I were friends with, that were close with, only me and one other still stands in the pulpit today. Rest of them are gone, backslid, or dead. Bible school don't save you. Bible schools don't save you. And so uh, with all of that being said, it got to the middle of the year. You start, you know, the end of August, September, whatever it is. And, uh, and, and after Christmas break, if you didn't know what you were going to do afterwards, you were looked at like, <gasps> how could you not know what you're going to do? One said, I'm going to go back to Florida. I'm going to start a church. I'm going to buy it. This one said, I'm going to buy tents. This one was going to go and do this, and this one was going to go do that, and, and I'm going to be the next Reinhard Bonnke, and I'm going to be the next T.L. Osborne, and, and I mean all of this stuff. And people, uh, and, then, and then God forbid you ask somebody who didn't know what was going to do. And so uh, I don't remember a time where I wasn't asked multiple times throughout January, February, and March. I, I, don't, I don't hardly remember a week. Let's say it that way, throughout January. Uh, Ken, what are you going to do when you graduate? I said, uh, hey, he said, or oh, Essence that said, you know what you're going to do if you graduate? I said, I've already heard from God. And you can always tell the ones who have it. Oh, you have? <laughs> oh, you have? Like, you got one on me. What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go home and I'm going to help Pastor Rothwell. Oh, you are? You're not going to go start a church? No? You're not going to do that? No? No, I'm not going to do that. Matter of, fact, matter of fact, I had people that was here, they're no longer here, 
that told me I should never come back here. Oh, yeah. But they're not here. <laughs> but I came back here and I told dad, whatever you need help, I'm going to do it. Whatever you need, I'll do it. I taught the junior class over in the south hallway. Yep. I did nursing home, handed out tracks. I did whatever. And then, yes, in 1988, I did become dad's associate. Back then, they had a vote on you. It was the most nervous night of my life. Two-thirds of the people had to agree. I don't know what the count was, but I felt like I barely slid in. (laughs) But anyway, I was a deacon. I became dad's lead deacon. I was an elder. Matter of fact, the only position I have not served in this church is a trustee. Outside of that, I've worked in the Sunday school department. I worked in the youth department. I helped Tommy Sinners and the men mow the grass, trim the weeds. I helped clean the church on the cleaning days. I taught the adult Sunday school class up here. Once I became the associate, was the youth minister, and never dreamed that I'd ever be here as the pastor. But I didn't go out trying to do something beyond the purpose of God because of pressure. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It was here that God worked in my heart to be what I am. It was the youth camps we went to that helped me be who I am. Even though dad knows and I know it, there was people, just a few, that tried to divide us. Thank God, after all these years, if this is the 40th year that I've been preaching here, I was here a year before that. So I've been here over 41 years. And he's still my dad. It's never changed. I'm not, I'm sure I wasn't, I was young, like any other young kid, teenager. You don't, you're not always smart. You know, one person said most teenagers need to be put into a barrel and you just pull the plug out every now and again to feed them. (laughs) But so I don't know. I'm sure ministry would be the same way. But anyway, you have to be able to start somewhere. If you're waiting, for that ultimate vision that God showed you, and you're not going to do anything till you get to there, uh, most likely we'll meet in heaven before you get there. Because you've got to be willing to start somewhere to be promoted. God will bless whatever you put your hand to, and you're not willing to put your hand to it, He can't bless it. Okay? He can't bless it. There's an element of submission and authority. I've done a whole series on that, which it's been enough years now, I could do it again. That means I've said that no man, no woman will ever operate in authority beyond their submission to God and to those who God put over them. I remember I had pastors ask me to come in and preach this series on submission and authority, and I did it. And I remember, you know, so many years after being here, I said, I'm going to preach this. I'm going to preach this. And I remember Angel asking me, are you going to bring somebody in? Or do it yourself. I said, I'm going to do it myself. I've never preached. I didn't preach it out of because I felt like I had a rebellion going on. I preached it out of protection, not out of correction. So if you preach the truths of, the truths of God in an area where it can be, where, where, where it, where it could be protection, instead of everything falling apart where then it has to end up being correction, you get further down the road to where you're going. But I believe with everything in me that without submission, you'll never experience authority. So submission and authority is in direct proportion to. So that means it, to the direct proportion that you are submitted is the direct proportion that God allows you or opens up the realm of authority and power to your life. It's kind of like give and it shall be given. To the measure you meet, it shall be measured back to you again. And so anybody that that understands this, 
makes it work. Now, there's a difference between submission and conforming. I told a person years ago, right here, matter of fact, I stand in right in that room. I said, listen, I'm not looking for conformity. I'm looking for submission. We don't get by just by conforming. The Bible says don't conform to this world, but be transformed. Just trying to conform won't get you anywhere. Because if you try to conform here, then you're going to try to conform somewhere else. But when you walk with the purity of heart, you'll live transformed. And therefore, you'll be able to walk in victory all the days that God sets before you. So, the truth is, without the anointing of God, we can do nothing. There's nothing we can do without the anointing. And so, we need the anointing. And the anointing is very important, very crucial. So, the anointing comes to us by God. God anoints us. Every believer's anointing. The Bible says every believer has an unction of the Spirit of God in them. There's an anointing, an unction in them. But also, there's an anointing by the laying on of hands. Well, I believe laying on of hands is a transfer. I was always particular who laid hands on me. I didn't let any Joe lay hands on me. I wasn't one just to run for people to lay hands on me because anointing is transferable. So was other things. So are other things. I had, I've been in meetings where there's been multi, multiple thousands of people and somebody in bed behind me wants to lay hands on me and I, I do this, I said, please no. I don't know, if I don't know the person or my spirit doesn't bear witness with them, I don't like people laying hands on me. If I'm in a position where they do that, I put a shield up real quick. I put a shield up. I receive nothing. There's no transfer. There's no transfer. Because the anointing comes by the laying on of hands. And other things comes from laying on of hands. And the anointing will come by association, how, who you associate yourself with. You associate yourself with good doctrine. The anointing that comes off that good doctrine will begin to affect your life positively. But the truth is, if you run with dogs long enough, you're going to scratch because you got fleas and you're going to bark. So association makes a big difference. And even in the things of God, I love the pure fellowship one with another because as iron sharpens iron, so does, so does one believer sharpens another believer. Our anointings help each other. It, it, it makes a difference in someone's life. You could be talking about the things of God and it's like God just sets right down in the midst of it with you. Years ago, there was a, uh, I took a team to Kenya and I told them before we went, this is when we were taking teams in, six, seven, eight people. I don't think it's some of the places we're going, it wasn't so safe for years because if something happened, trying to extract two or three of us out is one thing. Trying to get eight people out, and women and men, it's a little more challenging. And, uh, and I told, there was one man and one woman, I said, now... And I didn't say this pridefully. I understand the Bible. I said, now, when you're here, you're going to experience an anointing to operate and to minister, but don't automatically just assume, I can tell God's anointing me. This is what I'm called to do. Because it may not be what you're called to do. It may be that, like Saul, he got in amongst the prophets and he began to prophesy. He got amongst that and it started to affect him. It started to affect him. Are you with me? I'm trying to lay a foundation that's going to take a while to, to lay, to spring what I wanted to teach on. And, uh, and so one person decided that, yep, this is, this is what I'm called to do. They, uh, I was there about eight or eight or nine weeks. I left, they end up changing their ticket or something, stayed another couple weeks. Went over to the western part of Kenya. Next thing I know, they came back, sold their house, sold their goods, went back to Kenya. Ended up marrying a Kenya. The guy 
took everything they had. It was a woman, as a matter of fact. Took everything she had. She now became the first wife. Then he took a second wife, had children with the second wife, and she became the slave servant to the first wife's kids. Ended up dying in the land of Kenya and buried there. And all that it had to realize is, this is probably not what I'm called to do or where I'm called to be. But because we misinterpret what the anointing is for, we make life-changing decisions based upon an emotion that may not be really from God. So just because you feel the anointing, There's times when I'm ministering with certain people. It's a different anointing. But the, problem, the thing is, there's associations that are going on. And so the anointing will come from God because there's an unction. Number two, it comes by the laying of hands. And number three, the anointing will come by the association or the environment or influences around us. That's where the anointing is. So whatever we do, we must prepare ourselves for what God has. And preparation is not just praying. It's praying. It's studying. It's willing to serve anywhere we can serve. Anywhere we can serve. The truth is, this I don't feel led has hindered a lot of people from stepping into their destiny. And I'm teaching this because... We want to teach people who they are in Christ, how they can live a life of the Spirit, and how they can reach and find their destiny. That's what it's about. So no matter what you do, this is preparation. All right? Now, this talking about God gave gifts to men. I'm going to, I'm going to divide. I'm going to talk to people. We have ministers in the house. We have what they call laity. I wish there's another word for it. Uh, I realize that uh, there are teachings that, according to verse 1, we're all called. We are all called. And I realize that they said verse 1 is exactly the same thing as verse 11, that he gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And I believe at times if it's explained well, it operates well. If it's not explained well, it sets people up thinking there's something when they're really not. Now, there, is, there, are, there are gifts that people operate in leadership. And if you take, if you take the, the apostle, the apostolic gift, and you make it a small a and say this is a leadership or an entrepreneurial type gift versus someone that stands in the pulpit apostolically with authority, uh, 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 causing things to change and develop are two different gifts. And I don't want us to ever be confused with it. Which what makes every one of us able to do what we do in this house and on our jobs, on our employment, is knowing that God graced us and gifted us in areas that we can accomplish it in. All right? To gift us in areas that we can get things done. But we're never going to shun away from preparation. Uh, in 1999, Angel and I were living down on South Main Street next to Shiloh Springs in Harrison Township. Bought our first home there. And uh, I was praying. I started going to Kenya in January of 94. I was in Kenya January 94, August of 94, March of 95, August of 95, back again in February of 96. That's pretty regular. And uh, it went that way, 96, 97, 98. Things were happening. Things were trans, you know, things were developing. Uh, not only in Africa, but here, my schedule, my preaching schedule was very active. We were seeing revival meetings, extended revival meetings. Things were going. And in 1999, I was praying because I remember what year it was because I remember talking to God. And the Lord spoke to me in 1999 in that house on Poplar Street, and he spoke to me, and he says, I'm ready to open up the first phase of your ministry in 1999. And I remember saying, 
what have I been doing the last 16 years? So I'm getting you ready for it. And from 1999 until 2006, right before I came here, what God began to do was far greater than what he did from 94 to 99. So the truth is, some people are probably would never go 16 years, but according to what God spoke to my heart, I was in a 16-year apprenticeship leading my own ministry, if you would. But according to the Spirit of God, he was ready to put me in the first phase or the first part of what he was really calling me to do. Now, that didn't mean that everything I did was wrong or everything I did didn't count. What it did was everything I did proved me faithful to do what I was getting ready to do. And what was amazing about that, in 1999, sitting back in that office where the men's restroom was, in 1999 is when I came here on a Wednesday night. I'd been preaching out, and and, uh, Pastor Roswell had missionary Frank Brazel here. And then he was talking to me because I just got back from Tulsa with Dad going to Winter Bible Seminar. And uh, we, were, we were speaking in the office. I was in the chair. And he says, uh, I forgot you went to Rama. He said, there's a church in Visalia, California. I couldn't even say it. I thought it said Visalia. And uh, they were looking. They're a part of the IMA. And I'm the West Coast uh, director. And they're looking for someone that preaches faith and excellence, how he put it. I'm going to give you his, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give him your name. I thought, all right. You know how many times that usually works? Maybe one out of 10. How many people said, you know, I'm going to give you somebody's name. And you never get a call. He asked me, were you going to be in California at all? And I said, matter of fact, yeah, Angel and I are going to be in California in July. We are taking our week vacation in July. That was the trip where we were on where I gave all the money away. And people chased me down. Now you're starting to tie the, the timeline together. And in that, it wasn't maybe three weeks, I get an email from this guy called David Shipman. He said, uh, you was reckoned to me by Frank Brazel. He says, you're going to be in California in July. I want to work it out. If you would come up and do a weekend meeting for me. And so uh, I emailed back. David and I talked on the phone one time. He's an email guy. He's a social media guy. Have you ever seen this stuff? Uh, and so we finally talked. So Angel and I were in that meeting. We, we flew out. We were there, you know, on Monday. We, we left on a Sunday afternoon or something. Was there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And on Friday, we took a rental car and drove to Visalia, California. About three and a half hours or so, four hours to get there. We met, we preached Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. That four days in 99 started a total different phase in my life. This is the phase where people started looking to me now. I want you to be a leader in my life. From 1999 until today, Pastor David Shipman has been one of the most faithful men that I've ever been around. He's faithful. He's honorable. And I never dreamed when I got the email that one day I would pastor him, his family. He'd carry the same name of the same. You see, that didn't happen pre-99. When God said, I'm getting ready to put you in your first phase of ministry, that same year, God set me up for things to happen that's never happened before. And from 99 until now, it's just been a constant thing how that goes. Now, the point is, if you're not willing, I'm not saying everyone everyone can't work in the nursery at one time. But if you're not willing to be faithful at the door, most likely you're never going to be found faithful at the pulpit. So wherever you're faithful, that's where God will lead you. 
And most likely, those who are the most gifted in certain areas, that may not be what your ultimate. God will use your talents. But I've seen most things that people are called to do, anointed to do, are beyond their natural ability. Because if you could do it yourself, you didn't need God. It gets beyond your natural ability in what goes on. So Pastor David, his family we met in 99. is with me in Africa in 2000. We were in Russia together the first part of 2001. And 2004, I finally officially ordained him out of Lightnings of God Ministries. Even though I had come to peace started in Kenya, uh, here I was able to do that. Our documents allowed us to do that. Now they're all, the ordinations are under Covenant of Peace International. But I saw that phase one actually starting to materialize. So God didn't say, okay, this is phase one. Uh, you're going to start stepping into an anointing that one day is going to be more of an apostolic anointing. Uh, I'll just give you a little blurb, but uh, you won't understand it until it really happens. So let's just forget about it right now. There was none of that. It was, you're getting ready to enter the phase one. Well, what, 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 well what's phase one? Uh, it's called Abraham left the country, not knowing where he was going to go. It was called a step of faith. That's all it was. That's all it was. I had no idea. I'm still praying to live overseas or something. I don't know what Angel was praying. <laughs> but that's what it was. That's how this happened. That's how everything happens. So, if you walk it out today and you decide I'm going to humble myself, I'm going to submit. I'm going to allow God to use me. I'm not going to get ahead of God and watch God bring things into alignment in my life. Because that's where we are at, okay? Now, in doing this, let's go back to verse 1. I therefore the prisoner, Paul saying, of the Lord Jesus Christ, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. Now, I'm going to use a phrase that I've used for years. Let's take the word call out and use the other word. It's in the, it's in the original King James uh, translation called vocation. Wherewith you, the vocation, wherewith you are called. And I like that word vocation because I said dealing with whatever God puts in your call or your vocation. See, I, 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 I didn't apply on, on, online on heaven. I didn't go on heaven.com and say, I apply for a job for a work in Africa. I apply for the spirit of revelation to teach with an apostolic anointing. Send. I didn't do that. How many knows I didn't get to pick it? God chose me. And that's where there's been so much competition, especially when you see third world countries. Because people think that because you're not here, you're really not anywhere. But the truth is, this becomes very ineffective if it's not for a strong understanding of what happens here. You get what I'm saying? I am so limited without a body that understands who they are and how God can use them. I am so limited. Jesus, no matter he was the son of God, the anointing without measure, even in his hometown, he was limited on how he could do miracles. But he had to have 12 men to invest in to help him accomplish what he was there to do. We're limited without people. You know, I know people joke, the ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. Well, there's times I have echoed that. But the truth is, there's no need for ministry if you don't have people to minister to. Now, we do like it when people grow up. We do like it when this is a sanctuary of the mature. 
not the adult nursery. We like it better when people are walking in the spirit, not in the flesh. We like it when people are unified, not strifing. We like it when people understand that this altar is holy and the tithe is holy to God. And, and, and when we obey this covenant, it opens up the world of prosperity and it eliminates lack and defeat. This is a place where we get the revelation. But when it says walk in the vocation or the location, I tell people this Understanding there's a vocation, absent from the revelation of your location, where you are with him, will not advance your life. So it's not just my vocation, it's not just my call that gets me where I'm at. It's not just your vocation, it's not just your call that gets you where you're at. It's your location, understanding that I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places. That my authority comes from that location in him. So I've said many times, it's not so much my vocation that's got me where I'm at. It's understanding my location. It's not the vocation, it's my location. Understanding that I'm in him. That he's in me. The Bible said heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. If I'm in him, then I'm seated on that same seat of authority with the enemy under our feet. Amen. Amen. So, if you have aspirations to walk in the purpose of God, then you're going to have to dedicate yourself to stay put in that location in God. So it's not just walking with God. You got to walk in God. You got to understand he's in you. And that's where it's at. Amen. Uh, selfishness never works. It doesn't work. Even from nursery school all the way up. Selfishness doesn't work. We teach our kids don't be selfish. Share. Share. Share, but it's amazing when it comes to some people's lives where they always want somebody to help them, but they're selfish and never want to help others. I'm not talking about sharing your your cookies now. I'm talking about sharing your life and time. Everything is good until you inconvenience me. But let me tell you what: the ministry walking with God can become one big inconvenience. I've never seen a convenient time where I've had to go to a family because there's an accident. I've never seen it convenient when I stood, be, when I sat between, when I sat, stood in front of an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old and told them that their dad died. There's never a convenient time for that. There's never a convenient time. So the ministry, you've got to be willing that walking with God, you will be Interrupted. At times, but that interruption has great reward, has great reward, has great reward. I know we're quick. Don't interrupt me. But that God's interruptions has great reward. Amen. Has great rewards. I don't know how many times I couldn't count them and I don't really care. On a Sunday night, on a Sunday afternoon. That I wanted to go rest after preaching once or twice. That I ended up finding myself at the hospital to two or three o'clock in the morning. You, you, you know why I've never complained about it? Because I watched a man that stayed days at a time in a hospital and never complained. See, there's things that you do. And people watch what you do. There's times I've told people, don't, don't ask that person because they, they, really don't, they really don't want to participate in anything. And if, they're, and if they're sitting there waiting on somebody to ask them, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to ask me. I'm not going to let somebody ask you. 
I'm not doing it if somebody asks me. Get out of that. Make yourself available. Make yourself available. Surrender yourself to God and to a need in the kingdom of God, in the house of God. And allow God to promote you and set you on a course to what he designed for you before the foundation of the world. Amen? Amen. Well, let's stand together. Come on.